groups. Uh, good afternoon. Unfortunately, uh, we missed the chairman here. So we're going to start by yourself. And so uh, let me talk uh, as a first speaker about the management of the invasive type of fungal infection in paranasal sinuses. As you know, the, this is the background. Invasive aspergillosis in paranasal sinuses is not a common disease in comparison with a non-invasive type aspergillosis in paranasal sinuses. But this disease entity usually coincides with the immunological host, immunocompromised host, uh, such as immunodeficiency patients, and they age patient, and patients with DM. We're going to say the opportunistic infection. And clinical outcome of this patient is not satisfactory. The prognosis varies in each case, depending on the effect of the multidisciplinary treatments, such as medication of the antifungal agents or surgical intervention. But still, the very poor prognosis, we say. Most recently, we have experienced seven or eight different cases of paranasal sinus aspergillosis embedding to the orbit and the skull base. Therefore, I'd like to show a little briefly, I mean, the touch on these patients. Uh, this is just a summary of the clinical pathological features of eight cases, just one missing, uh, most recent one, as you can see. Even though we get a you know, combination of the antifungal agents, also the surgical intervention, the patient, what in the early stages of the patients, almost a day passed away. But later on, after we became clever to handle this patient, um, some of the patients survived well. Uh, this is a just you know, case five, 42 years old female. But she came to the hospital, left to ptosis, double vision, but no abnormal finding in the, in the past history. But now she underwent chemotherapy with acute megalostotic lymphoma. That's the reason why she got immunocompromised host. As you can see, the right side. And then now uh, we got you know, CT scan, preoperatively and MRI too. Uh, when she got the, maybe hospitalized and consulted with the EMT department, she got already, I mean, the uh, esmoid involvements and as well as the intracranial, I mean, the uh, abscess in there. And postoperatively, uh, this, I mean, inflammatory response is gone. This is actually clinical causes, and before and after, we got operation as well. Because of the uh, leukopenia, maybe she got you know, this kind of severe infection and fungal infection as well. And the later on, because of the increase of the uh, leukocytes, she got well prognosis, as you can see. Uh, this is the operation finding, as you can see. We did endoscopic esmoidectomy and sphenoidectomy, as you can see here. But we can see there, like uh, s maybe inflammatory in the sphenoid sinus region, as you can see. But taking after all of them, but small leakage of the cerebral spinal fluid, leakage over there. And this is another seven, eight years old female. She got left book of pain just at the mission. And DM, no control, the hypertension as well. But nasal cavity looks normal, but no ocular symptom. But as you can see, beta de glucan, 109, it's a superb, I mean, the high. It means the fungal infection in the full body, as you can see. And this is a CT finding on admission on the left. Show the region in the left maxillary sinus, fusmanoid sinuses, with right intraorbital extension. But bony destruction was found at the medical wall of the left orbit. And also MRI on the admission showed the reason in left maxillary sinus with intraorbital extension as well. And bony destruction was found as well too. 
Here, this is a finding of navigation-assisted cold well root copulation with endoscopic observation as well. Maxwell's sinus was fulfilled with granulation tissue and caseous substances, and bony destruction was seen at orbital floor, but we intended to leave periosteum uh, with removing inflamed granulation tissues as much as we can. This time, we could have an option to take out whole orbital organ just in case, but we didn't. So this is the pathological findings of the inflamed tissue in maxillary sinus, you can see. Aspergillosis present in the necrotic tissue and branching with 45 degrees angle. And this is a post-operative CD finding, even though uh, she got still the inflammatory responses on the left orbit. But region decreased in, and drainage is okay through ostium. But orbital wall invasion is still there to be very careful. And post-operative clinical causes, and you can see the beta d glucan level in there. As you can see, the control of the disease control is also good because there are so many antifungal agents and also irrigation with amphotericin B, as you can see. And C has been uh, alive maybe for the last 40, uh, four months is there. <coughs> and this is a critical cause of beta degurkan level in outpatient clinic after C, I mean, went out of the hospital. As you can see, stop with renal dysfunction because of the renal function, and we stop the uh, baryoconazole for 100 milligram. And still later on, the beta degurkan level is okay. That means no remarkable infection of fungus there. Oh, I have tried to skip this one. Oh, this final, I mean, the case is case one. It's a newly, I mean, the welcomes, the 85 years old male patient. A chief complaint, acute visual disturbance on the left side. This patient being complaining eye pain and visual disturbance for seven days before admission. To be. The complaints, also the complications, cerebral infarction, also static hypotension and depression as well, but no DM. But as you can see, the nasal cavity, no abnormal finding when we see. But ophthalmology department, they said, relative affluent papillary defect presence. And we checked the blood examination, WBC. And better the Gurukan, very small, nothing in there. But we can see the city finding, as you can see, very small nest like structure looks attaching with optic nerve, and the bone absorption can be seen at the po uh, posterior wall of the ethmoid sinus, but no intracranial invasion. MRI finding two, nest like structure is seen at the orbital apex with high signal with T1 weighted image and low signal with T2 weighted image. Also high signal around the optic nerve, as you can see. Oops. Oh, might be there. Video should be working, but it doesn't, so go ahead. But this is an operative finding, as you can see. On the left, the fungus ball is overlying optic nerve prominence. And taking out fungus ball, we are able to see the bone distraction is a case. And optic nerve is exposed with inflammation. And then uh, we did, I mean, the decompression of the optic nerve as much as we can uh, through the endoscope. And this is the just your know, pathology, as you can see. H is staining and growth staining as well. Hyper are lining up, showing branching to the outer direction sharply. Septum formation is clearly shown with the growth staining, surely diagnosed as aspergillosis, as you can see. Uh, this is a post operative clinical cause. Uh, we did administration of antifungal agents, so so enough. But later on, renal 
malfunction appeared with low potassium because Baryconazole was finished day eight and then. And post-operative steroid administration to attenuate optic nerve inflammation like this. But no fungus ball is seen in ESMO cells anymore. But no recovery of the visual loss of five months is after the ESCS. Uh, as just as I'd like to show that this is a 2000 IDS guideline for aspergillosis. And they recommend primary therapy, baryoconazole. And they say they recommended the remedies. The ambisome should be alternative primary as well. Uh, this is a recommendation drug for invasive aspergillosis by them. But I'd like to skip this one. And this is a summary, I guess. You know, we have experienced eight cases of invasive aspergillosis in paranasal sinuses, extending to the orbit and skull base as well. As you can see, the CT MRI finding is very um, advantageous to make a diagnosis, even though the nasal cavity doesn't seem, does seem very normal. So here, however, in three of patients of eight cases, even though the various treatments, including surgical intervention, were not enough to rescue the patient, and they passed away for a short period of time because of the intracranial invasion. So this is my, my conclusion, as you can see. But I don't repeat again this one. Uh, this is just one I'd like to, I mean, the, uh, provide this information. What is a therapeutic strategy for life-threatening severe infection in North Korean language field? Because we should know the precise understanding of local infection, host versus microorganism from the theoretical backgrounds. Secondly, understanding of mechanism of proliferation escape of microorganisms from the host defense system. Thirdly, look patient immunological defense system. And fourthly, aware of the pharmacodynamics with drugs and the proper usage. And fifthly, appropriate manipulation of surgical intervention as well. And finally, the precise evaluation of patient prognosis post-operation or post-treatment. But finally, I'd like to propose one educational effort to make finalists. However, it takes a long enough period of time with experience-based medicine with good supervisors not depending on literature-based, evidence-based medicine. Thank you very much for your patient attention.